Hi again, everyone. Welcome to the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia's oh. musical Jewel Box. I am here talking with Chamber Orchestra conductor laureate Ignat Solzhenitsyn about what he's been up to, and he's going to give us some piano pieces. You just played us in with a wonderful Scarlatti, and we had a really great time listening to that. And hello, how are you? And uh, tell us what you're up to. Great to see you, Josh. And great to see everybody, all of our old friends, my old friends at the Chamber Orchestra. And uh, yeah, what a, what a, what a exhilarating, uh, outrageous piece this uh, Scarlatti is. And so, so much, so much freedom and the kind of a outrageous uh, wrong notes, seemingly these guitar chords and uh, just a way of, of uh, within the confines of 18th century Baroque styling to have so much freedom and so much fun. And uh, Scarlatti is just uh, always puts puts me in a good mood, and I think I think many people to to just uh, start start things off, start off a concert, or indeed our conversation today. Right. Uh, yeah. And um, Scarlatti, he rather famously doesn't. There's a lot of um, every. Isn't that the story everyone has that he's got he's got the hand crossings constantly, and that was his big claim to fame: is virtuosic hand crossings. Yeah, he must have been an extraordinary. A keyboardist himself, of course, these are written for harpsichord, uh, not for for piano yet. But just the ability to uh, the the technical adroitness required to cross hands, uh, repeated notes uh, are 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 so difficult to achieve, whether on the harpsichord or in the piano. And he sometimes writes repeated notes that are are very very difficult. And so so just the technical demands that some of the most virtuoso music that that we have uh, in any time. Right. Um, well, that was great. And we've got more great music coming up, which we'll talk about in a second. But before we do, I want to just catch up on um, a little bit of your history with the chamber orchestra, because, um, you know, we've had Dirk as music director since 2010, but he took over from you and you were in Philadelphia for a while before that. Right. Uh, so I'd love to just take us on the grand tour of how did you start working with the chamber orchestra and how many years were you with us? Uh, well, if you add it up, it was quite, quite, quite many years because uh, I started when I was still studying, conducting, and piano at Curtis. I was a double major at the Curtis Institute, and Mark Mostovoy, who was, of course, the founder of the Chamber Orchestra, and then at that point uh, still the music director, uh, he heard me conduct, and he invited me f here and there to to do some things with the Chamber. I remember some children's concerts and that sort of thing that made sense to begin with. And uh, things went, I think, really well. Musicians were so welcoming to a, really to a kid, to a, a, a young conductor starting out. And so little by little, uh, we got more involved with each other. Uh, first, uh, I was appointed assistant conductor and eventually, I guess, associate conductor and then maybe principal conductor and uh, eventually music director when when Mark retired. So it was kind of a, a, a gradual uh, transition. And uh, we I think we a lot of us grew, grew up together or grew together as we uh, eventually made our way, of course, particularly in my years as music director through so much different kind of repertoire and uh, different halls and different challenges. Um, bringing in different sort of segments of audience and and just building, uh, really building something together. Yeah, and um, speaking of all the different types of music that you did with the Chamber Orchestra, I have a great time. You know, I keep all of the brochures close by in case I need to go see. Do the people like that? Are we going to let me check the sales data for that year? And I'm going through all of these old concerts, and your concerts definitely do have a, a whole host, a variety of different different styles and eras. Um, did you have did you have a favorite? I mean, I noticed that there's you've got this one concert that was like Berg and Sinakis, and I thought that's that's a bold concert. My God! Well, that you know that may may or may not have been the highest uh, seller uh, of the concerts we do, but of course uh, it's so important that uh, I think uh, when we program uh, anybody any kind of program, but especially or orchestral programming, that uh, while keeping in mind, of course, the necessities of economic. Uh, realities and making sure that uh, programs are appealing and people will want to go. Of course, there's no point in having concerts if people don't come. But it's also so important to lead and not just follow, not follow taste, but lead and, uh, if you will, uh, 
create taste or a taste for a certain kind of music. So uh, for us, this it, in my time uh, as music director, the central repertoire, uh, of course, was the classical repertoire. So that's Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, Schubert, a little Mendelssohn. Uh, but uh, but also we explored a lot of 20th century music, of course, went back to Baroque uh, and even sometimes uh, late romantic repertoire in those rare cases, admittedly, where the instrumentation would allow uh, for, for a piece to be played by chamber orchestra. Great, thanks. And of course, we hope that we will uh, see you gracing our stage again, either at the at the podium or at the piano, which, you know, we uh, who knows what conversations may be happening for for seasons future. Whoa. -ho. So we look for we look forward to the inevitable day that you come back to us there. Um, but so let's take us into our next musical selection that you gave us today. And so we started off with a Scarlatti at the beginning, but now we've got some Haydn. So we can dive into the Haydn after we hear it, but just give us a give us your elevator pitch for what is this Haydn that we're about to listen to? Well, it, it couldn't be a greater contrast from that boisterous, positive, fun uh, Scarlatti Sonata now to this very deeply intimate, deeply personal music. This is the sixth, maybe greatest movement of the seven last words of Christ on the cross. Uh, th this amazing, unique work by Haydn. And this is a piano transcription of the sixth movement consumatum est, it is finished, that Haydn approved and that I have, I hope, improved uh, a bit at the edges to make even more close to the original version for orchestra, which of course was a piece that also uh, I did with the chamber orchestra, as some listeners and subscribers may remember. So this is the sixth movement of the seven last words of Haydn, consumatum est.
Great. My God, thanks for that. Um, and you're so small in that video, just like hide with surrounded by the darkness as, as it's all coming to a coming to a conclusion. Yes, it's it's a uh, well, there's in general in music, one ought to, in my opinion, focus on the composer and not in the performer first and first and foremost, at least in our field and in the field of classical music. Uh, and uh, sort of the way you saw that lighting there and just the whole the, the, the whole setup was, I think, conducive uh, to the performer, in this case myself, receding to the background, even visually, and then allowing the attention to be focused in that abstract, but also very concrete, personal way on the composer. And it's, it's also reminiscent, of course, in a, just in, a, in, a, in, in some uh, evocative way, I hope, of the the origins of this work and the and the very specific description that Haydn gives us of how the world premiere was performed. So it was a piece that that, as you know, was commissioned by the Archbishop of Cadiz in distant Spain in 1787 or for Good Friday 1787, when these last seven words or technically phrases that Christ says on the cross are to be depicted, portrayed in the music. And so Haydn wrote, had a great challenge in front of him because he needed to write, as he saw it, seven slow movements. How could these movements be, how could this music contemplation of what's happening, this kind of central event in the, in the Christian faith, how could it happen in, how could it be anything other than slow movements? And so, and of course, by the same token, it would be unlike any piece written before. And just to jump ahead, if we think of the 250 years almost since this piece was written, there still hasn't been anything quite, quite like it. Uh, it's not only in terms of the, the theme and, and its content, but in terms of this setup where it's just one slow movement after another. Uh, there is a the final quartet of Shostakovich is undoubtedly owes something to these seven last words and has six slow movements, but it's not seven and it's many of them are much shorter, but here you have seven movements of equal length and Haydn knew that, that he had to write very great music to keep his audience engaged uh, as opposed to writing a slow movement and then going to a, a dance or going to a fast uh, finale or whatever the case may be. And then he describes that, how it all worked. So the, this grand cathedral had its all its windows draped in black. So the natural light was kept out and uh, presumably lots of candles and, and incense and all the, all the things, but it was in the middle of the day, he said the service started at noon on Good Friday and the archbishop himself would come up on the podium uh, on the on the on the pulpit and he would speak those words the first word or the first phrase of christ and then give a sermon or homily on it and when he was done he would prostrate him come down and prostrate himself on the ground towards the towards the altar presumably and stayed prostrate as haydn's movement played when that movement was finished he would get up walk up to the pulpit read the second word and then a homily and again in silence of course prostrate himself and listen and the whole congregation listen to the second one and so this made a deep deep impression on haydn himself who i think rightly felt not just proud but probably very moved by 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 his own work and by the by the purpose that it served and so we know these details of how the seven last words the version for orchestra, the original version came to be. And of course, that's a version that we performed several times uh, with the chamber orchestra during my years um, as, as music director. Then later it was uh, transcribed uh, for oratorio. So in other words, he added chorus. And in the, in the, in the course of adding chorus, he added another movement. So instead of having just the introduction and the earthquake, which is another thing we could talk about, and the seven slow movements in between, he now adds a second introduction 
uh, almost like the prelude to act two, if you will, uh, in the middle. So that's, that's another fascinating, very unusual uh, part of the history of this piece that also shows us how much it must have meant to him. He didn't just recycle it and add words, uh, he really reworked it. And then a piano, the piece became so popular and famous that a piano version was made. And even though Haydn himself didn't make the arrangement, he, we have a letter from him to the publisher, Artaria, I think it was, commending the quality and the care that was taken in, the, in this arrangement. And so he said, please, I want this to be published and I want this to be widely known and it's, it's, it's a worthy arrangement. So now to fast forward uh, to our time. So I've taken this original arrangement and I felt that I've studied the piece enough and conducted it enough and thought about it enough that I could take this and I hope improve a bit on even on that version that Haydn was impressed with. Had it been Haydn's own hand, I don't think I would have had the courage. But since it was done by somebody, by a pupil or by a friend, I thought, you know, I can improve on this mainly from the point of view of I felt I could play more voices and more octaves than, in other words, bring it closer to the original version than the somewhat modest, technically, version of the 18th century allowed. So I thought I'd like to hear more of what I know is in there and what's literally in there in the orchestral score. Wow, that's good. You know what, I, I have a small suspicion that some of our more ambitious listeners as soon as this talk is over are going to now fast forward back to listen to it again with, with all of that incredible information. Um, so yeah, that, that touches on a thing that I, I wanted to ask about, like um, when you're playing an orchestral reduction for something on piano and, and you know the orchestral score so well, that has to influence how you're playing. And obviously, as you just said, you could add more octaves, you can bring other things out. Is there something that you do with the actual mechanics of your fingers that you try to knowing whether it's a clarinet or an oboe, or if it's a brass line, do you, do you give it a different color as you're bringing those voices out? Yeah, that, that's a wonderful question, Josh. And uh, yes, I try my best for sure. And that's why, that's why oftentimes in, in the old, I guess one still sees it, but in the traditional uh, two piano reductions or, or single piano reductions, any kind of piano reductions of orchestral works in this, 17th and 18th and 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 not so much 17th but 18th and especially the 19th century when mu the chief means of disseminating music was through the salon was through the private playing of a symphony at home because who knew who knows if it would ever come back to berlin or to london not to mention smaller places so the point is two piano two hands piano four hands were ways of disseminating and learning music and so many of those scores of those reductions will have just the right hand and the left hand, obviously, or four hands, but they'll say in small print, oboe or bassoon or palkin, you know, timpani. And so, and the point is exactly that, I think, to give, to in, enhance the imagination of the pianist who may never have seen the score, but to see, oh, this is supposed to sound, I can imagine what this is supposed to sound like if repeated notes are timpani notes as opposed to notes on the horn. Big difference. So in my case, of course, playing a piece that I am intimately familiar with as a conductor, in other words, as the score that I really know, then it's all the easier for me to know I what an oboe line on top, and we hear some amazing oboe writing in this consumatum est, in this sixth movement, uh, what that oboe, how it needs to soar, and how even on the piano, uh, an instrument that doesn't sing quite in the natural way that a wind instrument can sing, or for that matter, a string instrument, uh, we can try to create that illusion. Or um, a thicker, broader, richer sound uh, for speaking of the horn, speaking of the horn, or a trombone, should there be a, a kind of a church, uh, noble church trombone uh, in, in, a, in a transcription, uh, Schubert 9. Uh, or <clears throat> Mozart opera, and then how to bring that across. So, so that's a great question. And if we can ultimately, if we can imagine it as a, in this case, as a pianist, if a pianist can imagine a sound, imagine a color, he can ultimately find a way 
find a way to make it happen. The physical is less difficult than the the inner flight of fancy and the richness of imagination. Well, thanks for that wonderful insight into both piano playing and, and score reduction and uh, the uh, last seven words in itself, I think they're going to kind of have to become part of my listening for the rest of the day and hopefully for everyone else at home, especially if we can dig up an old chamber orchestra recording of it. Um, so it's there, I'm sure you'll find it. I'm sure well, somewhere, somewhere in one of these boxes. Um, so that's great. And we have another, we've got one more piece that we, that you got for us to, to play us out and as usual on our Sunday evening to get ready for Monday morning, but it's a, a rather big shift. We're launching farther ahead in time. Uh, with Debussy. So give us give us uh, your slightly more than elevator pitch to get us ready for this uh, golden fish. Yes, the, the poisson d'or, yes, goldfish, golden fish. I mean, D Debussy, of course, is the, the high priest of impressionism, if you will, and, and, and symbolism. But really, really, it's the picture that one always comes back to with Debussy and that he always came back to what he sees in his mind's eye as he's as he's writing and so this is why so many of his pieces a vast majority of his pieces i would say and movements whether for orchestra or for piano not so much i guess in chamber music but for orchestra and for piano have evocative surprising sometimes difficult to grasp titles, but titles that give a level of specificity and a level of uh, a kind of a, 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 a range of possibilities that uh, we don't associate normally with music that is, as we say, pure music or abstract music, music that, you know, what does a Mendelssohn slow movement mean to you? It means it could mean one thing to you and one thing to me and one thing to someone else. It's 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 almost too personal to describe. But here Debussy is wanting to point us, not just the person playing or the or the people playing, but then the audience to have to be biased, to be prejudiced already towards this is what I should be hearing. So Goldfish, this is a Poisson d'Or, is the third movement of the second book of Image that Debussy wrote for piano, not to be confused with a set of image or images that uh, he wrote for orchestra. And uh, there's also an early piano set, so it gets a little confusing, but this one is the image book two or set two. And it's a set of three pieces that have these uh, uh, evocative uh, titles. And uh, for example, the title of the second piece, it doesn't get any more uh, perfect than what he calls uh, the second piece and the moon descends on the temple that was the moon descends sur the, so the, on the temple what does that mean and so i mean i guess for me and probably for most people it's some kind of a of a of a picture of a of a of, a, of ruins right of nighttime ruins of a of a greek temple or maybe some other exotic eastern temple and and just the the act of contemplating it perhaps it's not so it's just it's just to sum that up it's not that it's about the temple or in this case about goldfish but it's what, how those titles make us make us perceive the music and so in the case of this poisson d'or as we're about to hear it's uh, a piece of that requires tremendous fleetness fleetness of fingers, a very light footed touch. Uh, because these goldfish perhaps are darting to and fro and and moving this way and moving that way in unpredictable and somewhat jerky fashion, it seems to me as, as fish in general and particularly goldfish seem to do. And so that kind of super alertness, again, by the performer and by the listener ready for a quick change is i think what this piece is about it requires uh, a very uh, a lot of technique a very difficult uh, kind of one of dbc's real showpieces 
But as always with Debussy, it's not just fast and loud. <laughs> in fact, most of it is soft. So it's fast and soft, which uh, in many ways is more difficult. So uh, just a wonderfully stylish and unusual and charming creation that I think uh, is, a, is just a fun way for us to, uh, to finish today's program. And uh, as you say, to go off uh, on the rest of our Sunday. Right. Well, thank you so much for talking with us, Ignat, and sh sharing with us these fabulous recordings that you've made. I'm really looking forward to listening to all of this and thank everyone at home for listening to us uh, as we've talked with our music director of old and uh, hopefully we'll see him again before too long and have a good week, everyone, and we will see you next time. Thank you.